Appreciate it. You know, I sit here and I reflect, um, which I never get to do. And I thought that was just incredible. Just incredible. Uh, fans were just awesome. Penn Staters, I thank you so much for coming out and being a big part of that success, that victory. And then as a young young boy coming out here and, and being able to play, coaching a game like that, I, my head is still spinning. Oh, that was wild. How many times did the lead change? Uh, 24. 24 times. So just an amazing game. I want to thank Franny and Iowa for allowing us to move a home game to the Palestra. And this wouldn't have happened if he didn't give the OK. And, uh, even though in the loss, I'm sure he thought this was a pretty memorable game for him. And we've created amazing memories for our, for our team right now. Uh, a lot of work still to be done, but um, we came out and got the necessary stops that we had to do uh, in the last four minutes there. Without Lamar, only, with Lamar only playing 23, Mike not having his best first half, we were able to find a way. And uh, our mental toughness, our mental conditioning, I felt really shine through when we were down seven and then down six. I felt like we didn't panic, and uh, that's what this group's doing. Pat, the, the heat in this place, did that play in your favor at all, given that you got Isaiah and Curtis to come off the bench and do what they did? You know what, Mark, I, I think so. Um, I think they had some guys banged up. Right. Uh, CJ got banged up for Iowa. 15 got banged up for a second there. I felt like our depth really helped us. And it was nowhere near 81, it was 120. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anything to do with this? There was Gail Catlett many moons ago was convinced that Bruce Parkhill turned up the heat and wrecked all of it. It was like this is the only game I can remember. Like and it's so funny saying some other places that I won't mention names that we go to. I think it's freezing cold. Yeah. So I think they. I don't know. Did you have anything to do with this? No. I didn't have anything. I'll talk to Steve down here, but I didn't have anything to do with this. No. Mm. Patrick, can you just be? Oh, can you hey, Dan, how you doing? The enormity of this kind of win in this atmosphere for where this program is and what it's trying to, you know, sound the dog of what you're doing to the fans and, and people in general. Yeah, you know, our vision um, has always been to be a top 25 team and um, to find success and go to the NCAA tournament consistently. That's what Sandy Barber wants and Lynn Holler, and that's what we all want. And we finally, by staying patient and staying the course and doing things the right way, we finally have gotten to the point. One more Steven stays, what a powerful statement. Mike Watkins remains loyal and we remain loyal to him. Curtis Jones is not coming here unless those guys are here. And our younger guys are getting better. Our, our Myrie Joneses and our moms dread. The, the impact of this win, I don't think I've seen, we're not gonna see it right away, but I think you're gonna see it in recruiting. And I think you're going to see it as far as people coming out to the BJC. Um, we have increased our, our attendance the last few years. Um, we are top 59 in the last two years. So it's going in the right direction. People are coming out. Students are coming out. So the impact there, I think, is really going to help. But recruiting is going to help. We had, we had some recruits here today. And I think they saw a hell of a basketball game. And we're doing a nice job in Philly already. So this can only help. Matt, did you have uh, Brockington penciled in to be an expector? Absolutely. Um, he is such a spark off the bench. I said this to the Big Ten people yesterday on the conference call. I really believe he's still trying to prove himself that he's worthy to play in the Big Ten. So he comes into practice trying to prove that he is a Big Ten basketball player, that he is a high-level player. So it's almost like he's trying to earn a scholarship. It's like, and I'm not going to tell him that he has one. <laughs> I'm not telling him because I want him to keep competing at a high level. But he had 30 in here as a high school basketball player. When, when he was at Ryan, what do you remember about him different that, I guess, NGIT wanted him and, and then he ended up yeah, at Lana. You know, what, it, was it, what was different about his game then? I think he matured, Dave. I think he just matured. His body matured. His game matured. He became more consistent in his approach and what he was going to do. I think it's maturity and I think it's consistency. Skills, yeah, shooting. Well, his... Yeah, his, he's not shooting great from three, but at Bonnie's, he shot very well. He didn't take a huge number of threes, but enough. Um, he's making threes in practice. So he's got a great mid-range game. He's an elite finisher. I think the last thing for him is threes. You mentioned that you know, he had the 31 here, but both I think his, both of his prior experiences were semifinals losses. Did you talk to him at all about what this building means to him specifically, or Lamar? And Absolutely, and Seth Lundy. 
Lamar cut down nets here. Seth Lundy cut down nets here. Brock made it to the semis. I mean, that's big time um, for those guys. So they feel very comfortable in this building. Did you get the sense that Isaiah maybe had some unfinished business with those those two losses? I don't know about unfinished business, but I, I would say he's out, he's out to prove that he belongs. Pat, you've won your last four games here. Can you tell me what specifically is it is about this place? This place? Yeah. I don't know. Penn State is coming out. Home court advantage. Great alumni base down in Philadelphia. Our guys are enjoying playing in here. I'm enjoying coaching in here. Tell me more specifically about like, the gym. Like, is there something special about walking in here? Um, I was with Steve Jones walking up, and we're looking at this amazing building. And it, and it takes you back again to my childhood when my father used to bring me or my older brother Tim used to bring me. And, uh, you know, you do you reflect, you get a little nostalgic. And uh, it's just an amazing place um, to watch a game, to play a game, and to coach a game. And I feel like our guys understand that. I mean, the lighting's not the best. It's 150 degrees. And there's, there's an aura, or can I say smell, to an old school gym that's kind of like, you know what? It's a shame that we built all these huge arenas and the Final Fours in this huge arena. I mean, I get it. It's about ticket sales. I, I, I get it. But man, some some special about it here. Specifically, there was a, a point in the game where I think we were down six, middle of the second half. Stevens is out. Watkins is not really in evidence, even when he's in. And Brockington and Curtis Jones really gave you, really kept the ship afloat. Even even got you back in the game a little bit. Yeah, I thought. Look, that's why we play with great confidence. And if they're looking over their shoulder, that is that a good shot? Is that a bad shot? Then they're not going to make those shots. Brock, Brockington won one on four, and, and he got fouled. So it's like you're like, no, 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 yes. So it's okay. And Curtis knows that's his job. His job is to come in and search threes. For him to make four threes in that critical one in the last few minutes there was was enormous. We're going to go with Mark and then uh, John, and then we'll check in with Nate. Pat, we've seen Mike have games like that where he was just kind of lost the entire game. What did it mean for the team for him to step up with that big bucket at the end and play some pretty good defense? Yeah, you know what? I think Mike going in was so jacked up to play Garza, I think he psyched himself out a little bit. And go, I mean, look at Garza, he's a heck of a player, uh, what he did tonight. Um, but I thought he played better the last 15 minutes of the game. He had a little bit more energy, a little bit more juice. And that was a great pass by Miles Dredd. And we were talking in huddles that Mike's got to work that short corner, that porch area. And, and really, we, we need to look at him because he's got to be open because we were taking threes. Now, Kurt hit one. Miles is on the other side. MJ's up top. We had a really good offensive lineup in. It was such a great time to throw that lob. Pat, you mentioned Brock. Uh, he had a pretty big first half offensively. <coughs> How important was that, uh, you know, the rest of the way? I think it was, it was huge because Lamar's in foul trouble. We don't have a... Uh, Mike Watkins, that, that's been playing so well all season long. So for Brock to step up and keep the ship afloat, I thought was was big for him, big for his confidence, and we needed it because MJ wasn't at his best either. And usually MJ has been super consistent all year long. Mike, do you want to go ahead with the question? Yeah, Pat. Just uh, what was your thinking about when to bring Lamar back in down the stretch? Did you ever think about it before you actually did it? My staff and I talked about it a lot, and uh, we didn't want what happened at Ohio State to happen again, so I had to be patient. And the other thing is, we're down seven, down six, you know, I had three timeouts, uh, you know, we had to be patient there too. I just knew if I could get under the eight, then I could really start to go offense, defense a little bit more, and we actually put it back right around six or seven. And we, and we saved our timeouts that we ended up needing. Um, so for them to step up and play like that without Lamar, it's, it's credit to our depth. Nate, and then Ben. Nate, you're good. Ben, do you have a question? Hey, we're good. Thanks, everybody.